your seats. All right, cross-examination, you can sit down, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Curry, you're not board certified, correct? No, I'm not. Not in clinical psychology or in forensic psychology, correct? No, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. But you're not board certified? No. Okay, and you also have only been practicing approximately eight years, is that correct? That's not correct. How many years? I've been licensed for 10 years, okay. and I've been practicing for about 15 years. Okay, and that includes what you went through with your different trials in Hawaii and everything else that you testified to, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you went to Mr. Depp's home for dinner and drinks before you were hired as an expert in this case, correct? That's not quite what, right. I was interviewed at Mr. Depp's home by his legal team. Dinner was served. You, in attendance with Mr. Depp was Adam Waldman, correct? Yes. Ben Chu, correct? Yes. Camille Vasquez? Yes. Okay. And the dinner lasted approximately three to four hours, correct? Yes. And it included the interview. drinks, correct? Yes. Dinner and, I believe, drinks were served. Okay. And this was before you were hired as an expert, correct? Yes. This was an interview so that they could make an informed decision as to whether or not to retain me. And don't you think that's a little odd that you're getting interviewed by Mr. Depp? to decide whether you're going to testify adversely against Amber Heard? I was interviewed by the legal team. Okay. And Mr. Depp was present. It was his home, correct? Yes. And he was serving dinner and drinks. He correct? was not serving dinner and drinks. Well, it was at his house at his behest, correct? Yes, it was at his house. Okay. And you were contacted by Camille Vasquez, somebody you knew in the community, in February of 2020. Is that correct? I knew of Ms. Vasquez professionally. We live in the same city and I work with many attorneys. Okay. And at that time, you not only knew Johnny Depp, you'd seen a number of his TV and movie roles and you believed he was a good actor, correct? Not correct. I did not know Johnny Depp. Well, I had you seen knew several of, of his movies. You knew who he was? Yes. Right. And you believed he was a good actor? Correct? Yes. Okay. And then you provided an expert designation in this case before ever seeing Amber or having an opportunity to review any documents or records. Isn't that correct? I did not provide an expert designation. That's, that's an attorney thing. My opinions are contained in my report. Can you pull up plaintiff's exhibit 884, please? This was plaintiff's designation, identification of expert witnesses in this case. And this is dated February 2021. That's a, a year after you went to dinner at Mr. Depp's house, correct? Yes. Okay. And it attributes, if you go to page 13, it says you have three opinions. The first of those is that Amber Heard, quote, exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder. Did I get that right? I'm reading that here. That is not my opinion. Okay. Well, but it's, it's a current opinion, but this was not an opinion of mine then. I didn't have any opinions at that time. It says Dr. Curry will testify, correct? That's what it says, yes. Okay. And this is a signed pleading, correct? On behalf of Mr. Depp. I, I'm not sure I understand what that means. What? You don't understand what a signed pleading is? No. Okay. Do you understand that Mr. Depp's counsel prepared this and served it on Ms. Heard's counsel? I, I'm not an attorney. I don't understand necessarily all of these procedures. Okay. Are you aware that Mr. Depp is on an audio recording years earlier taunting Amber Heard that she has a borderline personality disorder? I was made aware of that in this case, yes. So you heard, did, is Actually, that one of the audio Actually, not necessarily taunting, but I do recall hearing that Mr. Depp had used that phrase. So it's a coincidence that you now think she has those attributes after the attorneys listed it in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, and Mr. Depp had made that accusation to Ms. Heard years earlier. 
My opinions aren't based uh, on coincidence. Uh, it's an objection. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, yes. Compound, I'll sustain the objection. All right. It's a coincidence, then, that you came up with symptoms of borderline personality disorder years later after Mr. Depp has been taunting Ms. Heard in an audio tape. I can't them. speak to whether or not there's a coincidence. What I can tell you is my opinions are based on the results of my evaluation. And it's a coincidence that Mr. Depp's counsel attributed that to you, that said that to you in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Now, would you agree that a disproportionate number of women are tagged with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? No, that's not quite right. 75%? The way you phrased it is not quite right. Tell me, tell me what's right. Okay, so there are more women who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder than men. It's more prevalent in women. And trauma can cause borderline personality disorders, can't it? No. Never? Right now, we know that there are people who have borderline personality disorder who have sustained childhood trauma. There are also people who have borderline personality disorder who have had no childhood trauma. So like most personality disorders and really like most mental health issues in general, there seems to be both a biological component. In this case with borderline personality disorder, the research tends to support a genetic component and possibly a neurological component. And then there is also possibly an environmental component triggering those genetic markers. Do you know the percentage of women who are victims of IPV, intimate partner violence or domestic abuse, who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorders? I can't tell you the percentage off of the top of my head, but I do know that there is a larger, women with borderline personality disorder tend to have a higher prevalence of being involved in intimate partner violence relationships, being the receiver of violence, and being the perpetuators of violence. Now, you've never been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has a bipolar disorder. Is that correct? A bipolar disorder? Yes. That's not correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Do you recall having your deposition taken in this case? Yes. On March 21, 2022? I believe that was the date, yes. And were you under oath at that time? Yes. All right. I'm going to ask you to turn to page 207. And the question was, have you ever been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has bipolar disorder? And your answer at that time, will you please read to the jury? I'm sorry, page 207? 207, line 5. Ah. Could you No. Read? Okay, thank you. Now, when this designation was served in February of 2021, you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part. What was that? When this designation was served that you have in front of you as Plaintiff's Exhibit 884, oh, okay. you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? No, I had not rendered any opinions. My opinions weren't finalized until after my evaluation. Right. So when this came out, you had not rendered that opinion? I had not rendered that opinion. Okay. The second opinion that's listed in the February 2021 is that Ms. Heard repeatedly and characterologically 
perpetuated severe physical and psychological intimate partner violence, IPV, toward Mr. Depp over the course of their relationship. End of quote. Did I read that correctly? Uh, it says perpetrated, but other than that, yes. Okay. And so it, is it correct that they, that this pleading says in February 2021 that you are going to testify to that? This document, it, yes. yes. Okay. It says and, that. And you have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has behaviorally or characterologically conducted conduct that suggests they may be an IPV perpetrator, correct? I'm, I have to, I have to ask that again because I yes. stumbled. Okay. I can't Thank do you. characterologically. That one's just a okay. tough one for me. Okay. You have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has behavioral or characterological conduct that suggests they may have been an IPV perpetrator, correct? No, I've never been asked to testify for that. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, correct? No. And in fact, you do not hold that opinion now, and you were not even asked to provide such an analysis or opinion. Isn't that correct? No. Or that is correct, That's yes. correct. Okay. And you have never held that opinion, correct? No, that is correct, yes. Okay. In your third opinion, if we can go to page 14, was that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. Do you see that? I see that. You said it's my third opinion. That is not my opinion. All right. But in this pleading, it says that you will testify to that, correct? Yes, that's what this says. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, was it? No, as I said, I had not formed any opinions at that time. I had just been retained. And in fact, you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? In terms, no, the opinions that I've rendered are provided in my report. And, you and have, they're what I'm testifying to today. And you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? I, I'll sustain it. You have never arrived at the opinion that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, correct? That's correct. Okay. And in fact, you've said that has never been my opinion, correct? What I'm saying is that this, the opinions in here, I, these are not my opinions. My opinions are provided in my report. Can you please turn to page 255 of your deposition? And if we can start on 254 to give the context. I don't have that page. I'm sorry. 254, line 11. Oh, okay. And the question is now, the next one is, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. Was that your opinion in February 2021? And you answered at that time, no, correct? That is correct. And then I asked, have you ever arrived at that opinion in the time that you have served as an expert witness in this case? And your answer was, could you read that to the jury, please? Yes. So no, it's not the task I was cut off, or I, essentially what I read, what I said then was, no, that's not the task of DASH. That was never my task to determine. Can I say what that means? No. And then the question is, so is it fair to say that you have never arrived at an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. And what was your answer? Well, there was an objection. All right. I'll read it for you if you're having difficulty. Your answer was under oath, correct. That is not my opinion. That has never been my opinion. Isn't that what you said under oath on March 21st? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then I wrote, then I'm going to ask you, do you know who wrote this portion of the designation suggesting that these were your opinions in February of 2021? And what was your answer? I said no. Okay. Now, as of the time of this initial expert designation, you had not reviewed any materials, reached any opinions, correct? 
I believe I had just started to review materials. Um, I, I believe that I indicated that in my deposition. I had not yet rendered any opinions. I uh, hadn't completed my review and I hadn't conducted an evaluation. Okay. And in fact, you've never testified as an expert on IPV, intimate partner violence. Isn't that correct? I believe that is correct, but I may not be remembering all of my cases. Oh, let's go to page 200. Okay. Line 17. My question was, have you ever testified as an expert on IPV? And your answer under oath then at line 22 was what? Oh, gosh, let me catch up. Line 22. No. And you've never testified as an expert on emotional distress damages associated with IPV, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you've never been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse, isn't that correct? Uh, again, that, I'm reluctant to say that's correct because with 15 years of experiences, experience, a lot of my cases have been complex and that may have been a component, but I don't remember explicitly a case being just about that. Let's go Correct. to page 199, line 20. My question to you was, have you ever been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse? And your answer under oath at that time was? No. I've not, right? Sorry, isn't that, I isn't hadn't that found the said? page in time. Okay, you said no, I've not. But I right? have not. Okay. Now you also have never been asked to testify on whether an individual is being truthful in saying that they are a survivor of IPV, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and you have never qualified as an expert to speak to whether a person suffered from IPV, intimate partner violence, or was a victim or survivor of IPV, is that correct? That's outside the task of a psychologist to determine whether an event occurred. We assess behavior, we, we assess mental status, we don't detect crimes. So you have not been asked to testify to that, correct? It's not something that occurs, so no, I have not. And you were not ultimately asked to provide any opinions on that, correct? No, I was not. Okay. Now, you did not disclose in any of the designations or your report that you had met with and had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, did you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more yes. time? That you did not me. disclose in any of the designations or in your report that you had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, correct? I did not disclose that I was interviewed by the legal team, no. I asked a different question. Are you trying to resist that you didn't have dinner with Mr. Depp and drinks? I'm not trying to resist that, but it's not quite right. You did have dinner with Mr. Depp, did you not? I did. With and his you had legal drinks team with and Mr. Depp. Depp, did you not? And what? You had drinks with Mr. Depp, did you not? Drinks were served. I This was over two years ago. I may have had a drink with dinner, yes. In fact, you thought you had a mule something, right? Possibly. Yes, okay. And you didn't disclose that you had met with Mr. Depp, Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez at Mr. Depp's house for three to four hours and had dinner and drinks, correct? I did not disclose that. It's not significant to the report. You don't think that's significant, correct? I don't. Okay. But you've never been asked to meet with a client in his counsel before being retained as an expert, either before or after, have you? No. And you justified that it was okay in this case because it was a high profile case. That's not quite right. I justified it in this case. Actually, I sought consultation about it. First of all, the person who had retained his attorneys was unable to come to my office with his attorneys. And yes, this is a very visible case. It's been going on a very long time. And I understood that there would be a need to interview me and determine, make an informed decision about my qualifications. Can you look at page 240, please? Okay. 
Line three is my question. Would you agree it's a highly irregular to meet with the subject in a litigation? And your answer on that occasion was, I would not say it's highly irregular. I would say it's not something that I would typically do. However, I had not yet been retained on the case. This was a large, high-profile case, and I understood that I believed that it was appropriate for a person retaining me with such a high profile to meet me, to be able to vet me, essentially with the attorneys present prior to retaining me on his case. Do you recall that? Yes. That's what you said under oath, correct? Yes. And then I said, have you ever done that before? And you said, no. Correct? correct. And then I said, have you ever done it since? And you said, no. Correct? Correct. Okay. Now, would you agree that if you did not find something that would be in favor of Mr. Depp and negative to Ms. Hurd, that you wouldn't be an expert in this case? That Essentially, you into court if, you, if you're going to say that Ms. Hurd is right and Mr. Depp is wrong, correct? So as a forensic psychologist, my obligation is to the court, is to the fact finder. I present science regardless of what that science may be. Now, when I take a case, my retainer agreement is explicit about that, and I discuss Dr. that Perry, with I'm the attorneys. Asking you, I'm asking you a question. I'd like you to try to answer okay. my question. You understand that if you found favorably to Ms. Hurd and negatively to Mr. Depp, you wouldn't be here, right? You wouldn't be testifying. Objection to speculation. No, I, okay, sorry. Hold on. The objection to speculation. I, I, that's, that's not speculation. No, I'll sustain the objection if you want to ask. Okay. If... goes to bias, Your Honor. I sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. All right. You were, in fact, so excited about being involved in this case that you told your husband, even though this was a highly confidential matter, that you were going to be conducting the examination of Ms. Hurd, didn't you? That is not accurate. You not only told your husband, but you told Ms. Hurd that you told your husband, correct? Ms. Bredehoff, that is not accurate. What is accurate? You're incorrect. That is not correct. You, is your testimony today under oath that you did not tell your husband that you were going to be conducting the examination of Amber? That is my testimony. Okay. Let's go to page 306. So the question that was asked was because you brought muffins, you said, from your husband, right? You get, and you gave those to Ms. Hurd, correct? May I clarify what occurred so that we can stop talking about the muffins? What happened was that I was getting ready that morning. I frequently bring muffins to the office. My husband did happen to know that there was going to be a celebrity client coming in because on the mornings that that occurs, which often occurs, we have to actually clear the office and move the staff to the other office. So yes, on the one hand, he was aware of that. I was getting ready. I asked him to go to the bakery near our house and pick up the muffins for me because I was running late. He often has to do that because I often do run late. He brought the muffins back to the house. I brought them into the office. Ms. Hurd and I enjoyed the muffins together. I think I made a comment to her along the lines like, we can thank my husband. He brought, or my husband got these for us today, meaning he purchased the muffins. We are now enjoying them because of him. Did, did you say on pages 305 and 306 that you frequently have examinations of high profile clients? You want to just take a quick look and tell us? Uh, what, 305, 306? Yeah, that's where we're talking about it. Is there a line you'd like me to look at? You can start with uh, 15, line 15, 305. Just read through that and tell me whether you said anywhere in there that you have a lot of high profile examinations. You do this frequently. I don't agree. I want you to approach, please.
So why did your husband get the muffins for Amber Heard? He did not get the muffins for Amber Heard. He knew you had a high profile client and he was and you were preparing for a very long time and you asked him to pick up the muffins, correct? I asked him to pick up the muffins for me, yes. Okay. Now, would you agree that domestic abuse can be verbal? Absolutely, yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be emotional? Yes, certainly. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be psychological? Yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be physical? Yes. Okay. Now, you indicated, and I believe you testified in your direct, that it's very important to review the treatment records before forming opinions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In fact, that's the first thing you would do, correct? Not necessarily the first, but it's part of the evaluation. Go to page 261. And let's go to 260 because that's where I start the question. The question I asked was, and do you recall whether you'd review any of these by the designation on February 19, 2021? And you said, okay, I can't say for certain. What I can tell you is that knowing my normal procedure, I would have reviewed the treatment records first. Did you testify to that under oath then? Yes. Okay. Now, before we start getting into the ones that you testified about, I just want to be really clear about what you actually uh, have as an opinion with respect to the borderline personality disorder and the histrionics. You didn't diagnose, you didn't actually have a DSM-5 diagnosis that Amber Heard suffers from either borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, correct? That's not correct. Your, in fact, your report says Ms. Heard demonstrates psychological symptoms of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder. Would you agree? Yes, I did say that in also what designation was that I believe January 18th that report was included? Yes. Okay. And that's what you said at that time, correct? Yes. Okay. I said a little bit more than that as well. You said, and I'll read it, I'll quote it, quote, based on the combined results of my interview with Ms. Heard, behavioral observations, psychometric test data, and review of the available records, Ms. Heard demonstrates psychological symptoms mm -hmm of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder, BHPD. That's yes. what you wrote in your report as one of your conclusions, correct? And that's a DSM-5 diagnosis. And it did not say that you were diagnosing with a DSM-5 for borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, did it? That's what it says in different semantics. Oh, so, so so what you meant to it say... It did not use the words you just said. Now, let's talk about the treatment records that you said that you reviewed. But I'm going to start with Rocky Pennington. Your testimony was that out of the blue, Amber hit R Rocky Pennington, correct? I can't remember exactly what I said, but I did reference Ms. Pennington's deposition that Ms. Hurd struck Ms. Pennington in the face. In yes. fact... Ms. Pennington testified that she hit Ms. Hurd, and in response to that, she can't recall, but Ms. Hurd either pushed or slapped her, correct? I don't recall. That's a pretty important distinction, don't you think? My recollection is that there was some sort of violence both ways in the relationship. Either way, it seemed that both of them might have been unstable. Uh, oh, I'm we, only evaluating Ms. Hurd. So, so now we have an evaluation of Rocky Pennington? No, from, I just said, but that was not relevant to my opinion because I'm only evaluating Ms. Hurd. But you testified to that on direct that that was a factor, right? Yes. Okay. Well, wouldn't it make a big difference if Amber struck first or just responded back? Given the dynamic, not necessarily. No, it would not have. So, so now you're an expert on Rocky Pennington and her dynamics with a Amber Heard. Yes. Uh, okay, so Draw. now let's talk about Dr. Cohen. You not only reviewed his treatment records and his text messages and documents, but you also attended his deposition, did you not? Yes. 
Okay. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that Amber told him about Depp physically abusing her contemporaneous with the events? I don't recall specifically his words, but I remember him recalling that she had disclosed abuse in their treatment, yes. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he received a text message contemporaneous uh, that Johnny did a number on me tonight. I'm safe in my support tonight, but I need some real help. Do you remember him testifying to that? I don't remember the testimony, but I do remember seeing that text message as one of the exhibits. And do you remember Dr. Cowan testifying that on another occasion, Amber sent him a text, Johnny beat me up pretty good last night, end of quote. Again, I... Not in this instance. She she's can rely on it. She testified. Over, over rule. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I didn't need to argue that hard, I guess. Do you recall that? Again, I don't recall the testimony, but I do remember that being an exhibit. I've seen it. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that not only did he believe Amber in her reporting of the abuse by Depp, but that she had no ulterior motive? I actually don't recall that. I'm not saying that it didn't occur. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he believed the relationship was toxic and he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being? I do recall him saying that he believed the relationship was toxic. And you don't recall Dr. I do not. Cowan saying that he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being? I don't remember those exact words. Do you believe, do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying in that deposition that you were present for, referring to Mr. Depp, quote, his controlling nature, jealousy and suspiciousness, addiction to drugs and alcohol, and violent and indulgent temper? Do you recall him using those terms to describe Mr. Depp? I remember thinking that would be an inappropriate impression for a treating provider of a different person to give, um, but I do recall him making that statement. Do you recall Dr. Cohen testifying that if he pushed her, she was going to push him back? And I never had the impression that she was the provocateur, but that she was indicating to me she had a hard time, you know, de-escalating these types of situations. Yes. Okay. And do you also recall him saying that she didn't say she pushed him, she just said, I got right back up. He told me that, she told me that he pushed her down and she got back right back up. I remember him saying that Ms. Hurd told him that, yes. And do you recall him testifying you could interpret it that way? I kind of interpret it more, you know, metaphorically, that when somebody comes at her, she goes back at them, you know, in a similar way, whether it's verbally or she protects herself. Do you uh, recall that? I, I may, I recall something along those lines, but it was a six or seven hour deposition, so the specifics are not fresh in my mind. Do you recall Dr. Cowan specifically testifying that he believed Amber Heard when she reported the physical abuse by Mr. Depp? I recall him saying that and following it up with a statement that you have to take the patient at their word when you're the therapist. You recall that? Yes. Do you recall him saying he took her, that he believed her? That he found her believable? Yes, yes, that he found her believable. Okay. Um, now, you also testified about Tony Banks. Do you recall that? Yes. And, and before we go there, Dr. Cowan has been a clinical psychologist for 40 years, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, he testified to that, didn't he, in the deposition? I don't recall. And he also saw Amber Heard for over two years, correct? Yes. From 2014, approximately August 2014 to... 2000 through 2016, correct? Yes, he did. For a period of time, would you mm -hmm. agree? Okay. And he also testified that he did not diagnose Amber with borderline personality disorder. Do you recall that testimony? He also testified that he doesn't use diagnoses, but yes, I do recall that. And do you recall that it was in, th those words were in his notes, but he said he had written that down, but then he discounted it and, and determined that that was not correct for her. All right, you want to approach? All right, now let's jump to Amy Banks. 
Dr. Banks is a psychiatrist, correct? Correct. Yes. And in fact, she went to medical school at Georgetown, and she did her psychiatric training at Harvard Medical School. Correct. I believe that's correct. I don't recall 100 okay. percent. All right. And she uh, was a psychiatrist in Massachusetts that Amber Heard had reached out to yes. after the Australia incident to try to help her relationship with Mr. Depp. Correct. Let me back up. You attended Dr. Banks' deposition as well, did you not? Yes, I did. And Dr. Banks testified to that, correct? Uh, I don't remember if she testified to that. I don't have the notes right in front of me or the deposition transcript. All right. Do, do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that she understood that Amber was in a relationship with Johnny Depp that had gotten violent and out of control? I, I don't recall specifically, no. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that they had physical altercations and his drug use had escalated and Amber felt she was at risk? I don't recall. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that Amber was reporting the violence by Mr. Depp and it was not consensual? I recall Dr. Banks stating that Ms. Hurd was reporting violence to her, yes. I do not recall a statement about consent. Do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that there was discussion about Mr. Depp cutting off his finger and she said only that it was a middle of one of these very kind of out of control escalated fights and that did make a fairly big impact on me? I remember something like that. All right. And do you recall Dr. Banks saying it was a whole other level? As I remember it told to me, he actually cut off a part of his finger during one of these altercations, meaning to me, the way I digested that, if you will, was that things had gotten particularly out of control. I do not recall that exact statement. I'm not saying it didn't occur. I just can't recall it. All right. And you recall that Mr. Depp was in sessions with Ms. Hurd with Dr. Banks, correct? I Yes. Okay. My understanding, however, is that they met with Dr. Banks and then it was primarily Ms. Hurd meeting with Dr. Banks for treatment after prescriptions and therapy. All right. And do you recall Dr. Banks saying that she was not surprised that Amber was seeking a re restraining order because of the violence that she knew existed in the relationship? I do recall that, and it would be impossible to know that violence exists as a treating therapist or as a psychologist. Again, we're not investigators. However, I do recall that she said that because I remember having that thought. And do you recall Amy, and she's a psychiatrist, right? Psychiatrist. Okay. And do you recall Amy Banks saying that it was clear to her that Mr. Depp was the one who initiated the violence? I don't recall that. Do you recall that Dr. Banks said that she knew for certain that Mr. Depp was the one who, who had committed the violence because Ms. Hurd reported it in the presence of Mr. Depp and he did not contradict? I do not recall that. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Banks ultimately concluded that it was her belief that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? Yes. Here, you want to approach? And what was your answer to that last one? I'm sorry. I uh, think I can't recall, but I also can't recall that last question. Do you recall that Dr. Banks concluded that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? I don't recall that. Okay. Now, 
You also reviewed the records of Laurel Anderson and you reviewed her deposition, is that correct? Um, let me uh, refresh my memory for a moment. Uh, um, I reviewed uh, Dr. Anderson's deposition, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she reported that, that Amber Heard had, had reported physical violence by Mr. Depp to her? I recall that she said that Ms. Heard had reported that, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she said that it, it changed over time? I don't recall that specifically. Okay, and do you recall Dr. Anderson saying that she had witnessed her face being bruised after the December 15, 2015 incident? I don't recall that. You don't recall that, okay. Um, and do you recall that Dr. Anderson said that Amber had reported that uh, he had pulled out her hair, bruised her face, kicked her leg, and hit her in the head? Yes, Ms. Heard did report that to her according to her testimony. Okay. And do you recall that Amber Heard said that Mr. Depp was scaring her? I don't recall that specifically. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Anderson said she believed that Amber Heard was a victim of domestic abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp? I recall, uh, no, I don't recall that statement. All right, let's go to Bonnie Jacob. You said that you reviewed the notes from Bonnie Jacob, correct? Yes. And what you testified to was that you discounted these because the first notes from Bonnie Jacobs indicated that she already had all of these symptoms, correct? Just, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. I discounted. Tell, tell, tell me why you discounted Bonnie Jacobs' notes. I did not discount Bonnie Jacobs' notes. You said that she, that Bonnie Jacobs, in her notes, had already determined that these symptoms were present for Amber Heard before the relationship with Mr. Depp, did you not? What I recall saying was that within Dr. Jacobs' notes, She's documented instances in which Ms. Heard reported to her over the course of therapy that she was experiencing nightmares, recurrent nightmares, in fact, about childhood abuse. Okay. Now, the very first entry on Bonnie Jacobs' notes, and th these are the notes, right? Do you recognize these? I do. And okay. we received more uh, sort of at the tail end just a couple months ago. All right, so the first of Bonnie Jacobs' notes is on 10-17-2011. Do you recall that? I, I don't recall the exact date. I don't have anything in front of me. And she was already, Amber Heard was already in the relationship with Johnny Depp at this point, was she not? I believe she was, yes. Okay. And in Bonnie Jacobs' notes, she documents, however, oh, go ahead. She documents multiple multiple occasions that Amber Heard reports to her physical violence uh, upon her by Mr. Depp, does she not? There are several notes that indicate that Ms. Heard has reported violence by Mr. Depp, yes. Many, many, correct? I wouldn't qualify it as many, many. I'm not sure what you mean how, by how, many, many. How many would you say? I don't know, I don't have the notes in front of me. Okay, well what do you recall in deciding to make your opinions in this case? Well, I'm confused about the dates because I know that Dr. Jacobs treated Ms. Heard even while she was in her prior relationship, leaving her prior relationship with her last wife. Uh, Dr. Curry, I'm not going to ask you to try to bring in extraneous things. I'm asking you what you recall of these But notes. the dates would have been different based on that alone. Okay. And I recall that there was quite a bit of information because these were copious notes spanning back in time from her relationship with Tasha. So, Dr. Dr. Curry... Please answer my question. How many occasions do you recall Dr. I don't know. Dr. Jacobs documenting Amber reporting physical abuse? I don't know. Now, you also said that you listened to audio tapes in this case, correct? Yes. Did you hear Mr. Depp admitting to headbutting Ms. Heard? That is not what I heard. You didn't hear that? I heard a conversation about headbutting. I did not hear him, as you said, admit to headbutting Ms. Heard. Okay, that's your characterization of it, correct? 
Yes. Okay. Um, the, did you see the videotape of Mr. Depp in the kitchen? Yes. Okay. Did Ms. Heard imagine that or create that, or was she responsible for that somehow? I'll, I'll sustain the objection. That's a question. Okay. Um, what, if any, impact did you have? Did that have on your opinions watching Mr. Depp in that video? I'm not sure. It, it was one of many pieces of the exhibits and other collateral data that I considered. I'm not sure what the direct impact was or if that could be measured. All right. Now, counsel asked you whether you had conducted any type of examination on Mr. Depp, and I believe your answer was no, correct? No. You did not review any medical records or psychological records from Mr. Depp either, did you? I reviewed all of the records that were available. Do, do you recall reviewing medical and psychological rec records I, on Mr. I, Depp? Yes. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein referring to Mr. Depp having rage? No, I actually recall him referring to Ms. Hurd in that note. Your testimony is that Dr. Blaustein was referring to Amber Hurd as having rage? I transcribed several of the notes, and I may be missing a time when he I said that about Mr. Depp. The handwriting was very difficult to transcribe, but there was one instance in which I recall transcribing him stating that Mr. Depp reported that Ms. Hurd had rage. Dr. Blaustein's deposition was taken, was it not? Uh, I don't recall. Do you recall, uh, so I take it then you don't recall him testifying that Mr. Depp told him he had rage and demons? I don't recall. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein testifying that Mr. Depp looked at his wife Amber like his mother or his sister that he didn't like? I haven't seen his deposition. I don't recall that. Okay. Now, did you see and do you know whether Mr. Depp has ever been diagnosed with any personality disorders? My, that's not relevant to my task to conduct an evaluation of Ms. Hurd. So, so would I, it, would I do not know that he has had one. It was not in the records that he did. All right. So one way or the other, you don't know whether Mr. Depp suffers from any personality disorders. There was, that's not my task. Okay. Let me go to uh, IPV perpetrators. Would you agree that accusations of infidelity can be considered one of the characteristics of a personality perpetrator of IPV? It can be a characteristic of a lot of things. It is something that can be weaponized if somebody is trying to or is having rage toward their partner. Let's go to page 270. Line three, my question was, are accusations of infidelity considered one of the characteristics of a perpetrator, a personality perpetrator of IPV? The objection. Um, it, the question is, is is vague and ultimately ambiguous. I, I don't understand the objection. I, I'll overrule the objection. Okay. And your answer under oath Can at that time. Can you remind me of the page? I thought page was, 270, line 3 uh, was where my question was. Okay. And your answer is at line 8. You said it can be, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And interrogating your partner about unfounded accusations of infidelity can be abusive. Would you agree? It can be if they're unfounded, yes. Okay. Um, and psychological consequences for a victim of IPV can include diminished self-esteem, correct? Yes. Depressed mood? Yes. Anxiety? Yes. Fearfulness? Certainly. Diminished self-agency? Yes. Feeling powerless? Yes. Loss of sleep? Yes. An IPV is a traumatic stressor, would you agree? It is. All right. An IPV is capable of resulting in PTSD, is it not? It is. Okay. An IPV is capable of resulting in other trauma-based disorders, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Now, Amber's medical examination, she was cooperative, correct? Her psychological, yes. She was cooperative and polite. Okay. And, and in the two full days of examination, you felt she was polite and answered all your questions, except in one instance where she furrowed her brow when you were asking about friendships in high school, correct? That's not correct. All right, let's go to page 275. So we start on 274 with the, was she polite? You said yes. Was she cooperative? Yes. Um, did she answer your questions? For the most part, yes. This is, uh, now we're on page 275, lines four and five. And then my question was, did she at any time become combat combative or unfriendly with you or angry? And your answer was, there was one instance in which she appeared annoyed and the posturing forward a bit, more assertive tone, furrowed brow, when I was questioning something, following up on data that had been inconsistent about friendships in high school. Other than that, she was very polite. Is that your answer at that time? That was my answer at that time, and it's inconsistent with the question you had just asked me. And would you agree that appearing for this examination with an expert who had been retained by Mr. Depp more than a year earlier might be a little stressful? Yes. And in fact, not only had you been retained by Mr. Depp, but what had been communicated by Mr. Depp's team was that you had called Amber Heard a liar and a perpetrator of abuse, correct? First of all, I, I'd like to clarify that I was not retained by Mr. Depp. I was retained by Mr. Depp's counsel. And what I can say that, yes, any examinee in a forensic context, you would consider that they're probably stressed. All right, would you agree that all perpetrators of IPV have anger management issues? Yes. And a large portion of IPV perpetrators have substance abuse issues? Not, uh, it, it's one of many factors that correlates with intimate partner violence, but there are certainly many people who perpetuate intimate partner violence who do not have substance abuse issues. All right, let's go to 131, line 17. One thirty-one, you said? Yes, line 12 is what I have here. And I'm talking about, you said, and just to give context, remember I was asking you how many, what percentage of uh, people you treat that are perpetrators, and you'd said 5%. Do you recall that, just for substance? I see that here. Okay, and then I, then I said, um, of the 5% that are IPV perpetrators that you've treated over the last eight years, how many of these perpetrators have substance abuse issues? And your answer was? I see that I answered with a figure of speech, a large portion. Okay, thank you. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Are Would you agree? Are you in a different area or are you asking me a separate question? I'm asking question? you a question. Oh, um, and it's common. sorry, can you please repeat it? Yes, and it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Would you agree? That's exactly how it was asked in the deposition. So I'm I, it is a compound question. I'll okay. the objection. It, it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight. I don't think that's, Your Honor, it's just, I think it's just one question. Um, <laughs> let me try it. To gaslight the victim, isn't it? That's a characteristic of psychological abuse, yes. Okay. And, and it's common then for them to accuse them of being the perpetrator, the victim. That's a characteristic of abuse from women perpetrated against men. It's actually very, very common. About 90% of male victims of IPV have reported that a female partner who abuses them makes threats to uh, report their partner as an abuser. It's less common for men to make that statement to female partners just because there's less potential consequence. Isn't it true, though, that some form of gaslighting is often present in these personality-based IPV scenarios? Yes. Okay. 
And it's distressing for the victim to be accused, is it not? Absolutely. It causes them a lot of fear? Certainly. And it causes them a lot of distress? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, they feel falsely accused, correct? Yes. And they feel paranoid? Yes. And they feel frightened? Yes. Afraid that everyone's going to believe the perpetrator, correct? Yes. And in fact, they're afraid they're going to lose their security, correct? Can you clarify what you mean by security? I'll ask the next one. And they're afraid they're going to lose their reputation, correct? Yes. Now let's talk about the testing for a moment. You talked about the MMPI-2, but that's not the most recent MMPI, is it? No, it's the most researched. Okay. Now, you, you need to have an elevated, uh, on the MMPI, there was only one section that had elevated uh, elevated scores, correct? No, that's not correct. It was the K section, correct? That's not correct. Okay. And was there any elevated score over 65 on the MMPI? I would need to take a look at it. If you know, I provided a 25 page interpretation outline. If you're able to pull that up, I'd be happy to go over any of the individual scores for you. Can you recall any clinical scales for the MMPI2 for Amber Heard that were above 65 as you sit there today? Again, there are multiple, multiple scales on this test, 25 pages worth listed. So if you can pull it up, then I can review and give you a competent answer. What can you recall as you sit there? I, I'm hesitant to do that because I don't want to make an error by ignoring hundreds of scale scores. And would you agree that you can't make a pathological determination or diagnosis if the scales are not elevated on the MMPI-2? I would not agree with that. Okay. Now, one of the answers that Amber gave is that it's hard for her to feel safe, correct? What are we, are you talking about the MMPI-2? Yes. Again, I don't recall. There are 567 items on that. I would need to see her results. Well, it's a common trauma symptom, isn't it, to not feel safe? Sure. And safety concerns are common among women who have been victimized, correct? Women and men, yes. Okay, and common especially for sexually victimized people. Would you agree? Any, any type of victimization, yes. And hard to trust, that's a common after effect of interpersonal violence related trauma, correct? Sure. And memory dif difficulties, Amber said she felt she had holes. Do you recall that? I do, and, and her it, account was different than typical me memory difficulties with trauma. It is, it is common for individuals who have experienced trauma. I, and it's actually not have. common, no. It's a symptom, but it's the least common. In fact, a DSM-5 diagnosis for PTSD includes a, quote, inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, end mm -hmm. of quote. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And memory difficulties are a symptom of PTSD, correct? Certain types of memory difficulties, yes. Okay. Now, do you recall when Amber says the first incident of abuse took place? I believe it was, oh, the first incident in which she, yes, so she stated that it was early on in their relationship. Okay. Do you recall it? I don't recall the exact date off the top of my head. Do you recall it being a tattoo, something related to a tattoo? I do. Okay. Now, if someone had been subjected to a four-year relationship characterized by repeated IPV, they can have symptoms, correct? Yes. Intense anxiety? Yes, certainly. Depressed or irritable states? Actually, this it's not so much states. When you're looking at a real trauma reaction, it's pretty uh, persistent. It's less of these transient states. Intimate problems? Yes. Relationship difficulties? Yes. And these are symptoms you're also attributing to the personality disorder, correct? Yes, there are some key differences. Okay. 
Now let's talk for a moment specifically about a couple of the uh, profiles on the MMPI. This is not an exaggerated profile for her, is it? No, actually that was something unique. When she completed objective broadband measures where the questions, you, you don't know what the questions are getting at, they seem completely random. She uh, raised scores that indicated that she was trying to minimize any mental issues and, and appear completely free of pathology. When she took tests that asked questions that were specific to trauma, that's when you'd see these extreme exaggerations. All right, let's go to page 337. My question on line seven, this is not an exaggerated profile, is it for her? And your answer under oath at that time was no, it is not an exaggerated profile. Do you see that? Yes, That's we're talking about the MMPI here. You yes. testified under oath at that time, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Now, the profile is also not consistent with malingering, correct? The MMPI two profile, it's specific to how she approached this test. And you're correct, for this test, it was a defensive profile, not an exaggerated profile. So my question on line 10 was, this is not a profile consistent with malingering, correct? And your answer under oath at that time was correct. On this test, it is not consistent with malingering, period, right? Yes. That was your full answer, okay. Now, is it your testimony under oath today that you have not been asked to testify concerning Ms. Hurd's behavior in the context of her relationship with Mr. Depp, including any abuse. That's correct. Okay. And you have not made any determinations, including any uh, of opinions that Ms. Ms. Hurd abused Mr. Depp or Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct, that's outside of the scope of psychology. Okay. And you cannot testify whether Amber Heard suffered any emotional distress as a result of any of the defamatory comments that she has alleged Mr. Waldman made through Mr. Mr. Depp made through Mr. Waldman, correct? What I can testify is that there was no indication of a decline in psychological functioning showing any injury since she's been with Mr. Depp. You, you cannot testify one way or the other on that, correct? Your Honor, may we approach? Okay. Dr. Curry. Yes. In your report, nowhere in your report did you uh, provide any opinion of whether Ms. Hurd suffered emotional distress as a result of the defamatory statements. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. All right, redirect. Dr. Curry, you were just asked a question about malingering. Yes and made reference to the MMPI-2. Is there another test that you did to make a determination with respect to malingering? Yes, so I also, well, malingering is a term that most psychologists, we try to be careful of it because it indicates an intent for secondary gain. I prefer feigning, which you had brought up earlier because it indicates that somebody is intentionally exaggerating, but I don't know necessarily why. 
So I think that's a more accurate term in general. Um, on the MMPI-2, yes, there was no exaggerated profile. I also gave her, though, the CAPS-5. I don't know if you'll remember, but that is the clinician-administered PTSD scale consistent with the DSM-5. And on that, there were signs of gross exaggeration. I also um, looked at the test results that were provided by Dr. Hughes. And on an objective test of trauma, um, there is a scale specific to intentional exaggeration on that test, and Ms. Hurd was in the 98th, profile, 98th percentile, meaning that she is, uh, she indicates, she had engaged in extreme levels of exaggeration. Thank you. Uh, you were asked about uh, intimacy problems, relationship difficulties associated with IPV, and, and you then said that there were some key differences. Yes. What are those? So what you see when we're talking about the personality disorders is there is a very consistent pattern of the aggression, the violence, the irritability. First of all, it's escalated. But second of all, it occurs when there is either, for the borderline component, a threat of abandonment, a perceived slight, feeling like the person is about to leave you, about to walk away to get some space from an argument. It's all, it also occurs to a let, more mild extent, but when there's a loss of attention and a need to manipulate to try to get that attention back, but it's not, when somebody has PTSD, that irritability is sort of at a low, constant level, or it's completely random. For instance, you might have a Vietnam vet who went straight to bars for a period to get into fights with the hope that he would kill somebody and just self-destruct. So it's a very different type of presentation. IPV, it might be more irritability, but that's actually less of a symptom for female IPV victims. Usually what you'll see is somatic symptoms, the depression, a lot of fearfulness and anxiety, but typically more complaints about somatic symptoms. Okay. You testified that uh, some uh, of the professionals involved in this case had to take their patient at her word. What did you mean by that? So when you're providing therapy, you're in a very different role than an examiner. When you're the forensic examiner, you're just really looking at data to make a decision. When you're a therapist, you're an advocate for your client's well-being. And in fact, it's considered extremely unethical for a treating provider to ever provide um, opinion testimony like I'm providing because it's so well known in our field that you're going to have an automatic bias for your client. It's almost a, a sense of protection, advocacy, wanting their best, which is why we also know that it's very inappropriate to um, convey any sort of opinion about whether a crime occurred, whether abuse occurred. We can certainly believe our clients. We can support them in their therapy and take them at their word. But when giving opinions and consultations, we have to be very, very cautious and really only provide the, the facts. We would state things in terms of, my client did report this. I saw this. Here was our treatment plan. Here was the diagnosis. It's, uh, we just, we're taught, we're trained to stay away from making any sort of opinions, understanding that most of the time and most of Ms. Hurd's providers were just treating Ms. Hurd. They had never so much as done an uh, initial, evalu or initial interview with Mr. Depp and gotten his whole life story or his symptoms or his side of any of it. Um, and they're going to be advocating, and, and the treatment relationship is about helping your client achieve well-being, not making uh, formal psychological or psych psychiatric opinions. So you're asked a, a question about a series of doctors. Dr. Cohen, treating physician? Yes, he was a psychologist. Yeah. Dr. Banks, treating physician? Dr. Banks, yes, treating psychiatrist. Dr. Anderson? Yes, uh, treating psychologist. Every one of them had to take Amber worded, Andrew heard it at word, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, overruled on that. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Is this witness subject? Yes, sorry. Uh, is this witness subject to recall? Yes. No. All right. Since you're subject to recall, Dr. Curry, please do not uh, 
discuss your testimony with anybody and please do not watch uh, anything of this kind. Okay. okay. All right. Got Thank it. you. Thank you. You can stay there for a moment. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and take our afternoon recess for 15 minutes. Do not do any outside research and don't talk to anybody. Okay. Go ahead and take our recess till 320. Your next witness is by deposition, is that correct? We will get you all set up then. All right, thank you. Oh, okay. We'll come back at 320 before the jury comes back out. We'll discuss your exhibits, okay? All right, thank you.